Hello, friends. I'm Kathy Fay, Executive Director of the Boston Early Music Festival, or BEMF. And I'm so pleased to welcome you to this very special pre-concert talk preparatory to the upcoming performance of our 2023-2024 BEMF concert season, featuring the incomparable Boston Early Music Festival vocal and chamber ensembles. Before I introduce our esteemed Boston Early Music Festival artistic co-director and world-respected lute virtuoso, Paul Odette, let me just say that all of us at Banff are thrilled to be presenting this highly anticipated program titled A Garden of Earthly Delights, The Extravagant Musical Entertainments of Marco Marazzoli. Paul, as you know, one of the great joys of our work at Banff is to discover and present less well-known repertoire and composers in our field of early music, thanks in part to your enthusiasm and remarkable ability to call our attention to these unexplored gems. You've been singing the praises of Marco Marazzoli for many years now, and you've been so eager to share your enthusiasm with Banff audiences. In fact, when you first mentioned the name, I had never heard of Marco Marazzoli. <laughs> to think that he was a tenor, an extraordinary harp player, and one of the most prolific 17th century Italian composers who wrote more than 380 cantatas, as well as operas, oratorios, motets, and liturgical works in his short life is astonishing. I know preparing this program has been challenging to say the very least, and I'm sure you'll talk a little bit more about your journey, but please know how grateful we are. <clears throat> For our Marazzoli celebration, we have assembled a wonderful cast of seven singers who will be accompanied by our outstanding seven-member BEMF Chamber Ensemble, led by you, co-director Paul Odette and Stephen Stubbs, playing an assortment of violins, Baroque harp, viola da gamba, lirone, chitarone, theorbo, baroque guitar, harpsichord, and organ. Reviewing our upcoming concert details, the first of two performances takes place on Saturday, March 2nd at 8 p.m. in Boston's Jordan Hall at New England Conservatory of Music. This program will re be repeated the very next afternoon in New York City on the BEM series at the Morgan Library and Museum. That's Sunday, March 3rd at 3 p.m. Tickets for the Boston performance can be purchased online, <clears throat> excuse me, by visiting the BEMF website at bemf.org or by calling the BEMF office at 617-661-1812. For those unable to attend our in-person performance on Saturday, March 2nd, <clears throat> virtual tickets are on sale as well. Our virtual presentation premieres on Saturday, March 16th at 8 p.m. and will be available for a two week period from March 16th through Saturday, March 30th. <clears throat> I should also mention for those interested in learning more about this program, the complete text and translations, fascinating program notes, concert program, artist profiles, all of this is available on our website right now. And before I disappear from the screen, it is now my pleasure to introduce Paulo Det, who is sure to open our eyes and ears to the work of Marco Marazzoli while sharing his enthusiasm and inspiration for this program. Thank you, Paul, and my thanks to all of you for watching this pre-concert talk. I look forward to seeing you at the performances in Boston on March 2nd and New York City on March 3rd. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Kathy and our board of directors and my colleague musicians for indulging me in this project. This is a project I have wanted to do for more than 30 years, and the reasons it has not been possible until now are myriad and complicated. But let's just say that for a long time, it was difficult to get uh, access to the sources. The sources are very difficult to deal with. They're, they're composing scores with a lot of crossouts and rewrites, and it's hard to decipher exactly what Marazzoli originally had uh, in in mind. Um, it's difficult to read the text. There are a lot of problems putting it together. But now we're at the moment where I get to finally realize this dream of presenting 
five of the seven cantatas for six voices and continuo, some of which have string parts as well by Marco Marazzoli. So I suppose the first question we have to answer is, who is Marco Marazzoli? And if if we've never heard of him before, he probably isn't very important or, or, or isn't very good because surely historians have looked at all of his music and decided it wasn't worth uh, performing. The next question we have to answer is, why is this repertoire special, this particular concert of, of the five cantatas? What makes it unique and worth spending so much time and effort to reviving? Uh, then I will talk about each of the cantatas and the plots involved in the stories and some special aspects uh, of, of each of them. But let's start with Marco Marazzoli. Who is this person and why have we never heard of him before? Marazzoli, as Kathy mentioned, was a tenor, a virtuoso harpist, and a composer. He was born in Parma around 1602, 1603. We're not sure exactly when. As a young man, he left Parma to go to Rome together with another brilliant young aspiring composer, Domenico Mazzocchi. They arrived in Rome in 1626, and Marazzoli immediately came to the attention of uh, the Barberini family. Pope Urban VIII, who was born Maffeo Barberini, and his three nephews, Cardinal Antonio, Cardinal Francesco and Taddeo. Uh, it was Cardinal Antonio who hired Marazzoli, probably around 1629, and Marazzoli began composing cantatas and court entertainments. He frequently accompanied Cardinal Antonio on his trips to Bologna, Ferrara, Urbino. In 1642, Marazzoli was invited to present an opera that he had written, Li Amori di Giassone e i De File, which was presented in Venice in 1642 at the same theater where Monteverdi's last two operas were presented the year before and the year after. So you had in 1641, Monteverdi's Le Nozze d'Enea, which sadly is lost. Then the next year in the same theater, the Santissimi Giovanni e Paolo, the most important opera theater in Venice in the 17th century, Marazzoli's opera, and the next year Monteverdi's Popea. So he was held in very high regard as a, as a composer. Sadly, most of his early operas are lost and maybe we'll find them uh, someday. That would be uh, wonderful. He went back to Rome after the success in Venice in 1642 and was immediately invited to Paris uh, by Cardinal Mazarin, who was actually Roman, born Cardinal Mazzarini, but in France, he was functioning as really the head of government um, at the time that Louis XIV was too young to, to hold the reins of, of power. But at this point, uh, Louis XIII was still in charge, but Mazarin was organizing a lot of uh, music and entertainment at court. And so he invited Marazzoli to travel from Rome to Paris and when he arrived and when the French court heard Marazzoli's cantatas, Queen Anne was uh, reportedly moved to tears and asked Marazzoli to stay in Paris and compose chamber cantatas uh, for her. Most of these cantatas would have been for solo voice, mostly soprano and uh, continuo, which could have been a variety of instruments, but one assumes that Marazzoli must have 
accompanied them on the harp himself. And maybe some of the cantatas that are notated in soprano clef were also performed down an octave by Marazzoli as a tenor. We do have a few cantatas by Marazzoli for tenor and continuo, as well as alto and continuo and bass and continuo, but most of his 380 cantatas are for solo soprano uh, and, and continuo. So while Marazzoli was in Paris between 1643 and 1645, uh, employed by the Queen of France, Pope Urban VIII died in 1644. And the new Pope who took over, Innocent X, had had a feud with the Barberini family. So the Barberini family was exiled to Paris. And Marazzoli returned to Rome in 1645 discovering that they were exiled. Now, the documentation is, is lacking here. I'm confused as to why he didn't know that they had been exiled to exactly the place where he had been living for the past two years, but maybe we'll never know. The point is, he returned to Rome in 1645, but he no longer enjoyed the patronage of the Barberini family because they were in Paris uh, in, in exile. So at this moment in his career, being a very resourceful musician and particularly a skilled composer, Marazzoli started composing oratorios for the famous Oratorio del Santissimo Crocifisso, which was one of the most important venues for the performance of, of oratorios in the 17th century in Rome. It is where Carissimi's famous Oratorio Yefta was, was also performed for the, for the first time. And the com composition of oratorios kept Marazzoli professionally uh, afloat during this time. Eventually, in 1653, um, the Pope Innocent X and the Pamphili family were reconciled with the Barberini due to the wedding of the Pope's niece with the son of Taddeo Barberini. And that meant the Barberini family was invited to return to Rome and Cardinal Antonio rehired Marazzoli and immediately commissioned him to compose an opera for this important wedding. The opera was so successful that they commissioned a new opera from Marazzoli for the next two years, 1655-1656. Um, and Queen Christina of Sweden arrived in Rome, and she hired Marazzoli as one of her chamber composers and, and uh, performers at the time. So Marazzoli was back on track to become a major opera composer after having started his career writing a lot of operas and now going back to it after the return of the Barberini family. And then the plague hit Rome uh, in a very bad way in 1656. And most public musical performances uh, had to be uh, stopped, but there could be music in private. Now, Innocent X died in 1655, and the new pope, uh, Alexander VII, hired Marazzoli as one of his court musicians. He had always been uh, on the payroll of the Sistine Chapel as a tenor in the chorus throughout the reign of Urban the Urban the Eighth, and then the interruption while the Barberini was in exile. He was now brought back by Ale uh, Alexander the the Seventh, Alessandro Settimo, as he was called, and Alessandro had the idea to ask Marazzoli to write miniature entertainments. They're kind of mini operas, which could be performed in large rooms in palaces. Um, the, the papacy had many, many different palaces uh, at this uh, point. 
uh, as did the Barberini family, because while the Pope had died, Cardinal Antonio was still alive and Marazzoli was still on his uh, payroll. So they could per perform entertainments privately uh, and get away from the ban on public performances that was caused by the, the plague. So the five cantatas for six voices that you're going to hear in our program are the result of the Pope's commissions to have Marazzoli write mini dramas that could be performed in large rooms in Palazzi. These are all, the texts are all directed at, uh, at the Pope uh, in, in his honor, in much the same way that all the prologues to operas by Lully praise Louis XIV. It'd be interesting to know whether um, uh, Pope Alexander's commissioning of Marazzoli to write cantatas in honor of the Pope may have inspired this idea uh, of, of Lully to follow suit, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a similar kind of situation. Now, there are a total of seven cantatas for six voices. Of the cantata output of Marazzoli, as I said, the vast majority are for solo voice and continuo, some of which have string parts. There are then uh, a collection of duets for all combinations of voices, two sopranos, two basses, two tenors, soprano and tenor, soprano and alto, et cetera. Uh, cantatas for three voices, cantatas for four voices, cantatas for five voices, and the ones we're focusing on, the cantatas for, for six voices, which are at the end of Marazzoli's career. These would have been written between 1656 and 1662, when Marazzoli died tragically after an accident which occurred during mass at the Sistine Chapel in January of 1662. So he was around 60 at the time. There was a serious accident. We don't really know the nature of it, but he passed away the, uh, the next day. These cantatas, many of them refer to the Treaty of the Pyrenees, which was the ending of the Franco-Spanish War, which Pope Alexander VII was instrumental in helping to uh, negotiate. So we know that these pieces cannot have been written before um, those two cantatas before uh, around 1659, 16. Uh, 60. So let's look at the at the five cantatas uh, on our program. I would have done all seven of them, but it would have been a very very long uh, program. So I chose the five that I that I like the most. The first one, La Vendemia, uh, is about the harvest, uh, and in this, uh, Bacchus is the the star character, and he and his Bacanti are enjoying the fruits of the harvest. And uh, each of the followers of Bacchus uh, spends the whole cantata praising their favorite Italian wines. This is a really fascinating text because it implies that the papal family were uh, very, very knowledgeable about Italian wines because some of these references are very obscure. Um, and as a passionate lover of Italian wines, it's my great hobby. Um, I had a lot of fun going through the text, trying to figure out what some of these uh, references uh, were. Some of them are quite obvious, but some of them are really uh, obscure. And so I've made some guesses in parentheses in the, my translation of the text about which wines were being uh, referenced. But I think eventually I'll need to consult with some Italian ampelographers to see exactly what what was intended. But it's this is a really fun cantata. The, the idea that I think Marazzoli had in writing these was to present maximum variety of the employment of his forces. 
So he had six singers. In the case of La Vendemia, three sopranos, alto, tenor, bass, two violins, and continuo. And he uses every combination uh, possible, starting with uh, a ritornello for two violins and continuo, solo recitation uh, by uh, Bacchus, which leads into an aria of Bacchus, which leads into a six-part chorus. And then there, there are various solos of, of um, the Bacanti chiming in about their favorite wines. They then pair off into various duos and trios and quartets and quintets. And towards the end of the cantata, they all become drunk. And there's a wonderful intoxicated a uh, chorus with a lot of slurping and sliding uh, around. And then a final chorus, which is uh, to salute the health of the great Pope Alexander VII. That's a very entertaining piece. And I think Marazzoli especially excelled in the composition of these uh, contrapuntally complex choruses, where not only each of the six voices is treated con contrapuntally, but also the two violins. And there's a notated lute part uh, in this, which is sometimes independent from the basso continuo line. The next cantata, Mortali o voi chi in altra notte, um, is in honor of the conclusion of the Treaty of the, of the Pyrenees. Um, and this is a cantata which does not involve strings in it. It is for three sopranos, tenor, and two basses. The reason that we have seven singers in our program is some of the pieces require three sopranos, and some of them require um, multiple basses or baritones. So we needed seven singers to cover uh, these three uh, cantatas. So this cantata, Mortali, as I said, is in celebration of the Treaty of the Pyrenees, in which essentially the border, which we still have today between France and Spain, was uh, established. Um, it was also part of the conclusion of the of the treaties was that. Uh, Louis XIV agreed to marry Maria Teresa of, of Spain. And unfortunately, um, Marazzoli died before the, the performance uh, of the wedding in 1662. And so Cardinal Mazarin hired Cavalli to write the opera, Ercole Amante, which some of you may have seen in our production in 1999 at the Boston Early Music Festival. Anyway, this is a celebratory uh, cantata, Mortali, about how great it is that now the two great countries, France and Spain, have come together and uh, with the, the uh, Holy Roman Emperor, who is one of the Habsburgs, is also, they're all united and they all live happily ever after. Um, and the eagle in his gentle claws at the end holds up a lily of peace at the end. The third cantata, which concludes our first half of the program, is called La Zenobia. This is the story of Radamisto, the king of Armenia, and his wife, Zenobia. This was a very popular story. There are many Baroque operas written on this story, the best known of which is, is Handel's 1720, Radamisto. But Handel's librettist completely changed the story. The original story, historically, is accurately portrayed in this text by Festini that uh, Marazzoli set. So Radamisto is the king of Armenia, having murdered his uncle, Mitridate, who was the previous king of Armenia. 
um, Radamisto was extremely uh, harsh and severe towards the Armenians, and they rebelled. And at the beginning of this cantata, he is being deposed. The Armenian army, which is a trio of two tenors and bass, are in hot pursuit of Radamisto uh, to drive him out of the country. And Radamisto and his pregnant wife, Zenobia, uh, are trying to figure out what to do under pursuit of the Armenian soldiers. And she proposes that they flee. And Radamisto thinks that a monarch would be unbecoming of a monarch to run away from danger. That would show weakness. And he had to show that he was uh, in control. But as the army came comes closer and closer, he realizes they have to flee. And they try to flee, except that Zenobia being pregnant and in pain from running, isn't able to go uh, any further. And she asks Radomisto to kill her, that she would rather be killed by her husband than by the barbarians in the Armenian army. And Radomisto says, no, I'm incapable of killing the one I love. And as the Armenians come closer and closer, he realizes he has no choice. So he gets out his sword and stabs her and throws her body in the river. Now, almost all of the cantatas of Marazzoli, the ensemble cantatas, have a, a moral or a summary of the important idea from the cantata. And the, the final line in this cantata is, love must be sacrificed so that honor will prevail. And this must refer to some kind of a uh, recent event in, in Rome. It can't just be an, an, a random story that, that they wanted to set, but we haven't figured out exactly uh, what that event uh, might, might have been. This was a very puzzling line to, uh, to, to translate. Um, but, but I think the idea is better to be um, killed by, in an honorable way, uh, by your husband than in a dishonorable way by a, a bunch of, of uh, barbarians. Uh, it's, it's kind of amazing, I think it's typical of opera, that Zenobia lives through this, apparently the the uh, stab wound did not kill her, and she is discovered by shepherds after our story uh, finishes. But she's still alive in the end to be able to sing in the final chorus. So you have a beautiful six part chorus at the at the end. Then we have intermission, and this is followed by perhaps the greatest of all of these cantatas, il riposo or repose. Repose is presented as an allegorical figure here, and he represents the Pope. And the Pope is in his boat on Lake Albano, which is the lake which is uh, where the papal retreat, the 16th century Castel Gandolfo, maybe some of you have visited, it's a magnificent palace, um, about 20 miles outside of Rome in, in the hills and lake area of, of the Colli Albani and the Castelli Romani. Uh, anyway, the Pope would often go on weekends or for a couple of weeks in retreat to the Castel Gandolfo, and he liked to relax uh, uh, in his boat, floating uh, on the on the lake, and the character of repose as the Pope is in his boat, and his followers are saying, "Oh, this is the most beautiful place. It's wonderful. Uh, we enjoy the tranquility here." When the lake, the angry lake, pipes in and says, "Hey, who are you who are disturbing my my peace and making waves and turbulence and 
uh, and so on. And um, the lake then asked a couple of local nymphs to support his position and the nymphs start attacking Reposo and his followers and telling them that they've got to get out of there and, and they're destroying this beautiful, uh, wonderful place. And there is a very long discussion that takes place between Riposo, Repose, and the lake, uh, in which Repose says he's traveled through the world trying to get people to stop wars and to be at peace with one another, and that both the lake wanting his solitude and tranquility and repose, trying to bring the world together in peace, wants nothing but peace and serenity. And that's why he comes out to join the lake in this endeavor. And the lake realizes, okay, they're brothers in this. It's okay if you come and, and, and visit my lake and enjoy the beautiful uh, scenery. It's an extraordinary cantata, which again explores every combination of voices and instruments that Marazzoli uh, could come up with, um, including the character of Repose, who is a baritone, is accompanied by two violins and continuo, and often sings trios with the two tenor followers. And then you have the lake who is a bass with the two soprano nymphs. So they're sort of two opposing trios who sometimes break into uh, duets and so on and end up with a magnificent and really beautifully crafted uh, final chorus, which says, where a God rests, and the Pope was considered God on earth, so where the Pope chooses to relax, um, this must be paradise. So in other words, where the Pope rests is heaven. The Lago Albano is, is paradise. It's like heaven on earth. There is a curious snippy comment that uh, is made in this final chorus, which he says, where a God rests, shut up you people from Greece and Crete. In other words, the Greek, the old Greek secular gods don't count, don't think of them as gods, but where a real God rests, that must be paradise. The final cantata, La Guerra e la Pace, War and Peace, we have the two allegorical characters of war and peace. And this is, again, another in the series of cantatas, um, several of which we're not doing because they're for four voices or for five voices, um, that are also celebrating the Treaty of the Pyrenees. And this is a very obvious one in this case because war is trying to get her, she's actually the goddess Bellona, the goddess of war, to get her troops riled up and to go and conquer uh, the world. And then peace comes and says, what is this horrible noise and commotion and violence that, that is being created? And they have a long uh, discussion, each trying to assert that they're more important than the other one. And Peace finally manages to persuade Bellona, war, to give up her warlike ways and to fight for peace throughout the world. And the person to make this happen is the great Alexander, the Pope. And so the final chorus says, our new hero, Alexander, is the new Alexander of Asia, referring to Alexander the Great, and the new Augustus of Europe. So we have peace in Europe. Asia is still at war because of the Ottomans, but eventually the Pope will solve that uh, as well. So another celebratory chorus at the end that the Pope heals all of the problems uh, of the world. 
And this is another cantata for six voices, two violins, and uh, and continuo. And just a word before I finish about Marazzoli's compositional style. Marazzoli is probably the most daring harmonically of all of the mid 17th century Roman composers. Uh, it's it's difficult at first to find a way into his harmonic language because there are so many notes in the vocal parts that clash with any sort of chord you could think of to play over the bass notes. And eventually it becomes clear, at least it became clear to me in studying the five and six part choruses to these, that Marazzoli was more interested in the direction of his lines than he was in what vertical harmonies were created every step of the way. He was more interested in getting from point A to point B, and the lines would go either ascending or descending towards a target or a goal, and there are fantastic harmonic crunches along the way, um, which go beyond the wildest experiments of, uh, of, of even Monteverdi. To go back to my original question, who is Marco Marazzoli and why haven't we heard of him? I think the answer is the manuscripts are very difficult to decipher. Um, and we're finally being able to understand the way he he wrote and to recognize the, the handwriting and to be able to figure out. We have clear enough high definition scans now to be able to decipher uh, the manuscript. And the next question was being able to understand his musical language. Now that we've done this, I think you're in for a real treat because the music is outstanding. It's incredibly varied. It's expressive. It's joyous. Um, it's kaleidoscopic in its textures. And it is a real revelation. And I hope this is only the first of a series of Marazzoli cantatas that down the road we'll be able to explore those for five voices and those for four voices and uh, uh, and so on, and then hopefully get to the oratorios and the operas. But for now, that's uh, all I think I have time for in presenting this program of the six voice cantatas by Marco Marazzoli. I hope you enjoy this concert as much as We've enjoyed putting it together. Thank you.